You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I remember BBC did an article on me and it pissed me off, mate, and the title was Brendan Lockney and the Nearly Man. And I thought, how can I retire? Because I'm 33 now, mate. I just turned 33 last week. And it's like, I can't retire now without winning a world title. I just can't, like... Everybody's saying that to me, like, go on, like, what did you do? Did you shag <laughs> Dana's bird? That's what, <laughs> that's what people think of you, man. Yeah. Remember in primary school and you say, what would you do for a million pound? Like, what would you actually do? When I was entering that cage that night, nobody was beating me, mate. I was going to die. I was quite happy in signing a death certificate that night and going, if it don't work out, stretching me out and just bury me, mate. That's what I was thinking in my head. That's the mentality and that's why I've got it. The test of a man is when the shit hits the fan, when they've got nothing to get up for, when they've no drive and they've no motivation, then what are you going to do then? It's a full, it's a 24 hours a day, seven days a week job. I'd leave session, yeah? I won't answer my phone. I had my phone on airplane mode for 90% of that camp. I would leave training. I'd go and eat my pure prep. I'd get in bed. I'd put on YouTube, James English podcast. Yes, yeah, it's <laughs> Get him on. I put my full life on old James. Like, I don't have a gaff. I don't. My birds all in turmoil. My, uh, my family life's in turmoil. My... All I do is fight. Everything else is absolutely fucked. My mm. life outside of fight. I don't have a life outside of fighting. I wake up in the morning now and I'm like, what do I do? Boom, we're on. Yeah, bang. And today, nice and quick. Yeah, simple as that, bro. And today's guest, we've got Brendan Lockling. How are you, my brother? Pleasure, mate. Loving it. Glad to be here. Listen, first and foremost, congratulations on the win. The million dollar fight, like, you absolutely smashed that, like, your talent's always been there. For everybody to see, you've always been spoke about highly all around the world, like, great fighter as well, Bubba, like, but again, you just showed your talent with leg kicks with so much to then win that fight, but how are you feeling after that? Yeah, mate, it's a bit surreal, especially now. Don't forget, we're, we're, just, we're over three weeks on from the fight and I've just got back here. So you can imagine, mate, the bin mans and all that. I say, yes, lad, thinking, fucking hell. Just went for a coffee this morning. It's gone wild, mate. I'm, I'm buzzing all because it's uh, 16 years worth of hard work, this, mate. So mm -hmm. you can't say I don't deserve it. Yeah, man, I'm buzzing for you. I watched the fight and I was buzzing for you. Like, it's unbelievable to see that. I think you've got so much support and backing as well, especially the shit that's happened with the UFC and... For me, you should be there fighting for world titles, but no doubt, you never know what's around the corner. I always go back to the start of my guests. Mm -hmm. Where you grew up and how it all began. So yeah, we're in the great old city of Manchester here, born and bred. Um, just like any other young lad, mate, playing football. Like, if you're not around here, you're not playing football. What are you doing? That was it, playing football. Um, and then I always get asked, like, was you that nutter that you should fight everyone in school? And I just wasn't, mate. I was just a, good, a kid that was good at f football, good at sport, athletic was pretty good at long jump and a few other random little gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And then um, started to get to an age where it was like, I won't good enough at football. So it's like, fucking, I better find somewhere else. There's no way I'm getting a nine to five. And then uh, MMA kind of burst on the scene. My next door neighbor used to do it. And then used to go to his fights, but we're talking like 2005 here. Like it was brand new. When I say brand new, like people's like, are you watching that UFC stuff? You had to get it on a VHS tape, mate, from a shop in town. And then you used to put it in and watch it. That's how old it is and that's how long I've been in it. And then he uh, just bundled me in the back of the car. 16 years on, we got this big fella here. Uh -huh. What was it like, your first time sparring? Um, just the first time walking in the gym because it's just full of the local lunatics. Uh -huh. You had just heard about this mad thing from America and everyone just started trying to do it, but didn't know how to do it. There was no nutrition. There was no nothing. It was just the local lunatics with some handmade fucking bag gloves just levering each other as hard as they could. And then it was kind of like in the deep end and I was only the young lad and they were all a lot older, like the local doorman and all that. And um, yeah, ended up in it with them and then kind of got pretty good. I'd say after about five months of training on Tuesday and Thursday, two hours each, he goes, yeah, listen, we got you a fight. I said, I'll oh, what? I'll fucking fight anyway. Yeah, we got you a fight. And then the rest is history. What was the first fight like? <laughs> Mate, I've turned up to this fight, yeah. I'm about that big. Um... Turned up to this fight and then uh, I mean, fighting this guy. He's already had two fights. He's two and all. Luke Brown, shout out to Luke Brown. It's in Nottingham. I go there. I was shit, mate. I was so bad. Honestly, I was like, didn't know the date, didn't know the range, didn't know the distance. I had no martial arts background, really. Just training with these lunatics. 
And then I just threw an overhand right, hit him. He went down, he hit him a few more times and the ref stopped it. And I thought, that's a fluke. In my head, I thought, that is a fluke. I should not have beat that guy. <laughs> that's mad, isn't it? But the old MMA game, like I say, back then it was kind of, I didn't say frowned upon, but people were just thinking. No, it was. That, that's exactly yeah, the right word. It's like, mad men. There's no structure to it. There was no money to it. It was just a case of brawling streets. But now it's just as popular as football. It's as popular as any sport in the world. Like, if you're at the top of your craft in that, you've got a chance to then fucking be capable to do anything you want. Like, it is mad bastards. Every fighter I've spoke to, there is something <laughs> missing up here. I don't care if it's boxing, <laughs> karate, MMA. Like, you kind of look at them and you think, they're, they're so nice. But you think you're a you're a <laughs> deep inside I'm thinking you're a fucking psychopath. Like, that ain't normal to go there and people die. Like, that's how yeah. scary that sport is. Like people die. Like and for people, every fighter I've spoken to, they love it. They love it. Oh, I don't know if I love it anymore. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, lad. It's a fucking yeah. roller coaster. It yeah. is. And just to touch on your point, what you said there, you used the perfect word. It was frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Like I used to be scared to tell people, like for example, my ex-bird back in the day, like her parents, we can't tell them what you do though. I'm like, why? You, what, you're a fucking cage fighter. There wasn't an, it wasn't MMA then. You was a mm -hmm. cage fighter. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. got in a cage and had a fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've watched it now in 16 years, go from that to, wow, yes, MMA. And you're walking down the street and everyone knows what it is. So you can imagine, I've watched the sport grow from frowned upon to mainstream mm -hmm. in the space of my career. It's mad. Yeah. So what happens then after your first fight? Was that an opportunity to say, okay, I've got a career here? Or was it just still doing it a bit of fun, learning to be able to handle yourself? Like, what was the method of thinking? No, there was no careers involved in it still. Mm -hmm. It was it was semi-pro. Like, the promoters had just made up this thing called semi-pro so they didn't have to pay you. Mm -hmm. It was an amateur and it went pro, but they used pro rules, but they took a round off. It was two rounds instead of three. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have to pay you. It was bad, mate. And then I remember my second fight, they gave me another guy who'd had a few wins. And... Um, that one I was really scared, mate, because he'd knocked his first two guys out. And I knew in my head, well, I'd thought at the time that mine was definitely a fluke. In my head, that was a fluke. And when they give me this guy and I'm watching him, I'm thinking, fuck me, what are they doing? Like, I've got to fight him now after mm -hmm. doing that. And then I've got a funny story that my coach loves. So it was the night before, I was absolutely shitting myself. And I thought, right, I'll take these sleepers. Because I went from my bed to the couch. I was trying everywhere to sleep, but couldn't sleep. I took these sleepers. Still couldn't sleep. And then my lift outside, I was not going to fight. Beep, beep, beep. Still not slept now, but I've had all these sleepers. I remember in the car and I'm just, I'm melting in the seat thinking, oh God, I've had all these sleepers. And they're all like, yes, lad, you up for it and all that. Then I remember getting in the changing room and I'm like hitting the pads and I'm just lethargic. Like, and I said to my mate, Kane, he'll laugh. I said, I've had a load of sleepers. You know, he went, why? I said, I was shitting myself that bad last night. I had a load of sleepers. And uh, went out and just absolutely obliterated that guy in about 59 seconds. I was that scared. I just ran at him as fast as I could mm. and sparked him. And then that was two knockouts in a row. And then fucking hell, it just ended up keeping happening in an hour here. What do you think if you never, because we know the streets of Manchester, it's a lot of tough bastards here in Manchester, Salford, a lot of tough, tough guys. Like, a lot of crime down here as well. Gunchester, like, a lot of heavy bastards. I know most of them, but mm. where do you think you would be if you never chose that path of a fighter? Um, do you think you could have been involved with the madness? I just think I would have been successful in whatever I chose mm -hmm. them because I'm a proper determined little bastard I am. I just don't, if I get something on my head, that's it. Like this, I had that on my head. I had it as my screensaver. I had the pictures of it all around my house. I just wanted it that bad. And uh, and I got it, mate. And I just think if I would have took that energy into absolutely anything else, I would have been successful. So even if it would have been crime, I would have been mm -hmm. successful. I just know I would have. Mm -hmm. So the content... With what series you were on a contender but you were on the UFC was it 2014 as well 2012 2012 you won that fight and lost one is that correct so I went on to the Ultimate Fighter mm -hmm. um, got a phone call um, Team UK versus Team Australia um, I went uh, applied for it two and a half thousand people applied and only 12 people got on and then um, I didn't get an email back about going and then I'm either them like yeah where's my email and they went oh shit sorry must have missed you you know them come down to the trials so they had about 300 people at these trials. First you had to hit pads, then you had to pass that, then you had to grapple, pass that. And the last one, you had to sit in front of a camera and answer loads of questions. Then I pass that. And I was down to like the last 14, but only 12 were going on. Mm. And then they go, right, use of the 14, two reserves. We'll let you know in three weeks who the 12 are. So I'm in my head, I'm on. I'm like, yeah, sweet, training dead hard. Then gets a phone call on the Friday. They say, just let you know, Brendan, you're the second reserve. 
a second reserve's never got on before. So just carry on with your fights and then hopefully try again. But I was 19 at the time, so I thought, all right, sweet, no worries. I went to a BFA with my pals. Ended up partying there for a week, come back, and then the day I got back, gets a phone call. Someone's been injured. You need to fly out tomorrow morning and fight in Australia. In my head, I'd been round the bend, mate. I was going, oh, what do you mean I have to fucking fight tomorrow in Australia? Just went, fuck it, go then. Got on a flight, 24 hours to Australia. Fought this kid, Patrick Guy Dice, he was 9-0, and all, beat him. Then I got to the semi-final and lost to Norman Park, who ended up winning the show. But what an experience, mate. Eight weeks in a house. Or oh, 12 of us, 12 of them, 24 lads, just all stuck in a gaff together. Us against them, country against country. And uh, yeah, that was my first real shot at success. And then as soon as I came back from that meet, I was like, this is this is definitely for me now. And then just sacked all the work off, sacked anything off. And that was me full time. How was it for the loss on that show? Sweet. Was Didn't that? care because I was so young. And I was like, the guy, Norman Parker, uh, it was about 22 and five at the time. And I was four and oh. I shouldn't have even been in the cage with him. It was only because we was on this mad show and I was mm. a reserve, got the, got the call. But I give Norman a really tough fight. He still says this is the toughest fight to this day. And Norman went on to do great things in the sport. So I knew from 19 years old, this is me, mate. I really mm. did. So how many promotions have you been in since then? Loads. Fought in ACB in Russia, Germany. Fought um, Bama. Fought, um, had my own show for a while that I fought on. UFC, obviously. PFL, I've done the rounds, mate. Yeah, what ones have been the best? ACA was good because it was run by some mad Russians and they used to just get paid cash in hand at the end. Mm. Well, them ones, yeah, uh, dollar dollar bills at the end. Come to this old tower and give it a little knock. <laughs> and uh, they did a massive show at the MEN Arena. And uh, the guy that I lost to in the UFC, they actually put me a rematch against him in uh, the MEN headline that, and I knocked him out in the first round. Uh, Mike Wilkinson. So I got to avenge that loss. That was uh, that was a big one for me. But yeah, they've all been good to me, mate. I've had a mad journey for all over the world. That was my 41st fight the other day. That's how long, yeah, I've I've really been through the trenches, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So again, UFC, was it 2017, 2018? I think 2019. Was it a contender? Yeah. Like, you won, but you still never got a contract? Yeah, loads of controversy. So what is the controversy with all that shit? So, because people still talk about that. Mate, it's, there's more than that in people's heads. It's mad. So basically what happened was I, I, won, I went on a mad streak after that loss in the, um, the Ultimate Fight. A mad streak with beating everyone. I was number one in Europe for years. And I just wasn't getting signed. And I thought, what the fuck's going on? Did you do anything? Were you nah, pain in the ass behind the scenes mate, or something? Everybody's saying that to me. Like, go on, lad, what did you do? Did you shag <laughs> Dana's bird? That's what, <laughs> that's what people think. It's mad. Yeah. Um, I was like, nah, I can't think of anything. And then, um, anyway, they put me on the show, the contender, but contenders for guys that are like 4-0, and 5-0, just coming up. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was 20 and 3 or something. It was like, what are you doing going on there? So they gave me the toughest fight they could find. They gave me a guy who was a champion on the East Coast in two weight divisions, who everyone thought was going to wipe me up, and then put me on this show. But then Tyson Fury, Till, Marcus Rashford, Bugsy Malone, all of them are sending out these good luck videos. It caused a massive thing, like... I've landed in Vegas and everyone was like, this is our guy. And Dana's thinking, who the fuck's he? Like, he's just come out of nowhere. And then went in, wiped the floor with a guy, battered him. And then um, Dana just made this mad call. There's loads more to it. Um, and was like, nah, nah. He made up that I went for a takedown in the last minute. Um, and the whole MMA world was like, what are you talking about, mate? It was the most controversial thing that happened on the show. And then... Um, and ultimately, PFL picked me up a month later and look at that, mate. I, I, it's the best thing that ever happened mm -hmm. to me. You don't get that sort of money in the UFC anyway, do you? million dollars for one fight, plus no. what I earned in the preseason, mate. I'm a lot like, yeah, to win a million dollars, mate, in MMA, it's probably 99%. I've not, never done that, even the champions. Isn't it mad that? Yeah. Compared to boxing. Yeah, it's not. See if you were in the UFC, you got signed. Do you think you'd be anywhere near a million? I made five and five for that fight. $10,000 mm -hmm. I made. Fast forward three years, I just fought for a million dollars. Some of the top 20 fighters in that are only like 10 grand a fight. I do fucking those shitey like YouTube shows and I'm on double treble with these guys, full professionals who give their whole career for. No wonder they're pissed off. Well, I cried my eyes out, mate, after they can send the thing. That's all I ever wanted. Mm -hmm. And my corner team were like, listen, lad, this will be the best thing that ever happens to you. Your doors, your phone's going to be ringing, your door's going to be knocking. And it did, mate. The, the offers that were coming in people seen it and were like he's young he's talented he can talk on a mic he can do a bit he's exciting so the offers were massive 
and PFL just blew everyone else out of the water. It was like October. They said, we'll give you two fights for the end of the year. One will be at the Mandalay Bay, one will be at Madison Square Garden, and then we'll give you four fights in six months. We'll just give you unbelievable activity. And for me as a fighter, I just love being active. I want to be active. It's my job. Mm -hmm. It's what I love to do every day. I don't want to waste my best years in the gym. So when they offered me that amount of activity, I just took it a bit of hand off. And uh, yeah, mate. You've not looked back. Fucking flew with it. So the PFL, when you win the million, what was it? Is it eight fighters, 10 fighters? At first it was 12 last year. And I got to the semis and lost a split decision to the champion, my lead, a Russian guy. And then I just swore to myself, I'm like, I can't lose again. Like, do they do this every year? Every year, they just spin it, yeah. Are you going to do another one next year? <laughs> oh, I don't know, mate. <laughs> I don't know, it's hard work. But it's the fucking money, isn't it? It is. <laughs> but that's life changing. That changes your life, your family's life. Like, that's everything you've dreamed of. With that, because it got so much, you, you had so much love for you. All the sports channels, Sky Sports, mm. BBC Sport, like everybody backed you. Every message on social media, it was all for yourself. Like, do you think that will open a lot more doors for people to, to join this company? Um, well, it's all they've already signed quite a lot more. Don't, don't forget, I was the first English fighter on there. Mm -hmm. I was the first guy to ever go on their books in the UK. And like, even the owner Pete Murray and them, the great people, mate. They're really good ambassadors for the sport. They're on Channel Four. They're on ESPN. They're making all the right moves and they're handing out millions, mate. Six mm -hmm. mil they give out that night. Six champions, six mil. And it was like, it doesn't happen. They call it the richest night in MMA and it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to say they're losing purse, but it's it's tiny, mate. And it's like, your whole life is on the line. Imagine, someone said to you, remember in primary school, and you say, what would you do for a million pounds? Mm -hmm. Like, what would you actually do? When I was entering that cage that night, nobody was beating me, mate. I was going to die. I was quite happy in signing the death certificate that night and going, if it don't work out, stretching me out and just bury me, mate. That's mm -hmm. what I was thinking in my head. That's the mentality, and that's why I've got it. That's the what fighters should be paying, though. That sort of money that like the UFC is always known for it. But it's the sponsorships and other things that UFC can provide, the social media platform and all the other stuff that you can't provide. You even see Jake Paul in that calling UFC out for not paying their fighters well enough. Like, do you think a lot of fighters from the UFC could potentially jump ship for well, the money? Have, I mean, you've got Shane Burgos. Shane Burgos was a top 10 UFC fighter featherweight, and his, uh, his contract was up. And you've been calling him out? Yeah, yeah, Shane, yeah, yeah. Shane's a... Uh, a fucking good fighter, mate. Really mm. good. And he's in the tournament next year. But Shane got pulled in and his negotiation was up with the UFC. And he's a fan favourite at the UFC. And they were like, PFL just doubled him or whatever they did. And then he just went, you know what? And he was the first big guy to do it. Like to go, you know what? Like I'm off. And even Dana publicly came out and was like, fucking hell. We fucked up with that one. So I think that might be the start of things to come. Because if you think about it, you've got to, you can't forget that we're actually prize fighting. Like, people forget that. Like, you've got to pay your bills. Like, I don't want to be driving the bus at the end of fighting, mate. I really don't. Yeah. I put all this effort in. I want to be financially secure. I'm a family financially secure. But people forget that. They do and think of the three letters. And it polarises them. It mm -hmm. does. Yeah. So, see, when the, that tournament came up again, like, what were you thinking like, in your mind? Because it's all world-class fighters. Like, where were you ranked in the, on the bookies? favourites as well? Were you underdog? I don't know. I don't know that bit. But Do I, you I just check know any of that. that when you're fighting? Well, the semis was the biggest fight for me because the semis was against the favourite who to win the whole thing, Chris Wade. And uh, I was a three to one underdog in that fight alone. And um, Chris is a dangerous fighter, mate. And he was he was talking the talk as well. He said, I'm going to come to London, pin you down and laugh at you in front of 6,000 people at the Copper Box. And there's now you can do about it. And in my head, I'm thinking, fucking hell, he could actually do it. This guy's <laughs> really good, mate. Like, yeah. for example, how good he is. He give Islam Makachev his hardest fight in the UFC. He was five and two in the UFC and again left for money. But then I'm fighting him now at fucking in, in London in the copper box. And I'm like, oh, and just absolutely ran through him, mate. And I knew once I won that fight, that's why I said on the mic after, I'm going to be a millionaire now because mm -hmm. I knew that I would beat Bob or I did. I knew that anyone that comes in and just relies on wrestling against me, I know it's not enough to beat me. So I knew that in the final, I would be able to take him out and I did. Mm -hmm. See, how's your training how did your training go for this? Like, why were you so focused? You've always been focused anyway, but disciplined. But why was it different this time? Why did it look as if you were hitting harder, kicking harder? Like, mm. Was it the everything you've... Because I know you've spoke about your mum a few times and mm. paying off her mortgage and the support that your families gave you. But what was the mindset? Like, why was everything... You, you seem to have just blew everybody out of the water. It's true, mate. I, I think the first two fights of the season, I wasn't really myself. I told me MCL. 10 days out from the uh, Ryoji Kudo fight, the first fight of the season. And I just cried my eyes on me. I was like, wow, the whole season's done. And I asked PFL to put me on the next card. 
They said, no, nah, you can't. Basically, in the PFL, if you miss one fight, you're out of the tournament. You've got to do four fights in six months, so you're fighting every six weeks. And if you miss one, you're done. So I had to go in that fight with a torn MCL. I just strapped it up in the back, mm -hmm. got dropped for the first time in my career, and I just gritted it out and managed to beat this guy, mate. And I don't know how I did it. Then the second fight, I still half had the injury and had a really awkward opponent. That was a shit performance. And I was just in my head, I was thinking, have I still got this? I thought, I thought I'd lost it, mate. And then I just really bit down on my gum shield, went back to training, seen two different mind coaches. And I think that might have been the change because my coach was like, listen, you train harder than all these guys. So whatever it is, it's mental, it's not physical. Mm -hmm. So I started really working on this. I started putting pictures of the belt all around my gaff, started like speaking to this mind coach two, three times a week and just, it really, really changed me as a fighter. I don't, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's the hard work. Maybe it's a combination of everything. You know, but I can't pinpoint one thing. The belief system. Is that maybe, working yeah. on the law of attraction? It could be, mate, yeah. Mm -hmm. like, even now, it's a screensaver on my phone. I need to make new goals now. It's still all around my gaff. I've not pulled the pictures down. Mm -hmm. That belt, I've been seeing that belt now for the last four or five months. Every single morning, wake up and it's just there on my phone. Check a thing. It's there. It's just like, maybe you're right. Mm -hmm. But how does... If you were in the UFC now, featherweight division, like, where do you rank? Hi. Hi, I've sparred UFC champions. I've sparred Volonovsky. I've sparred them all, mate. I, I know where I'm at. Uh, I've trained with multiple years. Peter Yan, sparred him loads. Of, uh, and everybody knows where I'm at. And that's why everybody was so happy when I finally got what I deserve. Was that a kind of fuck you to Dana White as well? Not or was really, it just no. kind of... Because if you're not in that show, you're not getting that belt either. So... Like I say, the UFC still open many doors for you, even though they rejected you to sign a contract. Mm. How can it be a fuck you to Dana White? Yeah. Though? Because if he didn't reject me, I wouldn't have got it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I won't open my online banking now and see the numbers that I'm seeing if it wasn't yeah. for Dana White. Like I went to Corner Till on the weekend, and as we were walking out for the weigh-in, it's the first time I've seen him for three and a half years. Dana and he looked at me and he just gave me this mad smile, shook me hand. And I thought, that was fucking awkward, me. First time since the show that I've actually locked eyes with each other. Mm -hmm. And it was like, this kid actually went away. He's won nine fights since it's that show. He's blasted everyone out of the water. He's a world champion. He's a millionaire. And everyone else that I fucked off, just they, they, they disappeared. He vanished into thin air. Mm -hmm. I wasn't taking no for an answer, mate. And I found my own way. He was, he, that's what I'm saying. Like, he's seen fighters the last 10, 15 years. And he's, everyone he's chose, he, he chooses correctly. Like, that is a decision they got wrong though. <laughs> and Jinky's just too stubborn to admit it. I, d I don't know if anyone's straight up said that, but if you take into consideration what he actually said, he actually said, this kid's talented, this kid's got everything, but just not tonight. And what he did, there's loads of rumours about what really happened. Um, he knows the truth. Whatever it was, it was. But again, let's go back. I made five and five, mate. I made $10,000 after tax. After 30% tax in the US that they charge you, then after paying managers, after paying everything, I pissed blood after that fight. I smashed my nose to pieces again. What did I walk away with? £3,000. Like, mm -hmm. come on, mate. He, he turned me away and now look. So it's like, who's really won? Who's really, you know what I mean? Me. Yeah. And at the time when my corner team all got me together and said, this will be the best thing that ever happened to you. I said, how? The UFC is everything I ever wanted. And really, it did pay off, mate. It did pay off the way I wanted it. How did you end up in Dan Till's corner? I love Dan, man. I've always backed him. Like, I love his personality. I love that mad mentality. Like, how are you in his corner at the weekend? How'd that come about? So he FaceTimes me about three months ago, <laughs> four months ago, and goes, lad, I need to get out of Liverpool, lad. I said, yeah. I said, why are you come to Thailand? I was in training camp in Thailand. He said, yeah, can I live with you? I said, yeah, live with me. Sweet. Thought, whatever, he's not coming. Mate, the next day, he's like, ah, right, I'm here. I'm in Thailand. I said, fucking hell, you actually come. I need to get my head together, I need to get my shit together. Trained his fucking ass off. And then at my fight was a week or 10 days before it. So I went, right, I'm getting off. And then he said, before I got off, he said, well, you're calling me in mine. He said, you've been at every spa. We've been on the track together. We've been, basically, we've been in the trenches and nobody's seen what I've been through like you have. So will you do it? I said, fucking hell, you could do the coach, really. <laughs> and he went, nah, mate. He goes, I only need you, just do it. I said, okay, I'll do it. And then um, I had 10 days in between. So... Just waited it out in America. I actually drove Route 66. I drove over to him, just thought, well, how can I kill 10 days in America? And ticked another one off the bucket list. Got there and um, absolutely gutted for him, mate. I really am. It fucking really hurt, mate. It really, really hurt because he's a fucking 10 times better than Jikas Dabli. And he, he is. And the second round, he woke up 
started pinging him everywhere exactly like I thought he was going to do. And then in the third, yeah, Jerikas just... Jerikas is a big, strong lad and I think Darren's best years are at 170. He needs to go back to welterweight in my eyes. Yeah, what was the 185? Yeah. Is that because of the weight cut though? Is the struggle with his weight, don't you? It, yeah, the thing is, Jerikas is probably coming from 205. Mm -hmm. Darren's not. Do you know what I mean? He can make welterweight. It just means he has to be... Well, six miles every night, mate. Yeah. Six miles and mm -hmm. fucking tins of tuna. But okay. yeah, that's it's it. what it is. It's that losing. But everybody loves Dan. Like he's such a good guy. <laughs> and he's a fucking like he was so close to being world champion. Is that hard for a fighter? Like being so close, like you being so close to be the UFC, mm -hmm. like can that destroy a career when you're touching distance and you think you've made it and then bang. Like you don't see many fighters recover, and the ones who do end up kicking on and having a magnificent career like how how does somebody Dan's caliber a young kid breaking into the UFC having that mm. storyline of Brazil and being starved and fucking off coming <laughs> back and and killing everybody and having the scouts as your support but how does he then try and break that kind of losing streak is it four and five now well yeah he got pushed too quick mm -hmm. to fight Tyron Woodley at the time um but the guy's a fucking superstar mate like mm -hmm. I walked around with him Paddy was on that card. Everyone, he was getting the most numbers out of everyone. And Dana loves him. How can you not love him, mate? He's as real as they come. He fights hard as fuck. And he's just a fucking great fella. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think with originally in his career, he, he burst into the UFC, beat Wonderboy in Liverpool. Then they give him Tyron Woodley. I think it was maybe one fight too soon. Lost to Woodley. Then, then fought Masvidal. Dropped Masvidal. Was winning the whole fight and got caught. And personally, I've not been knocked out in a fight, so I don't know what it's like to come back from that. Mm -hmm. But it was a bad knockout. It took him a while to wake up. And um, I think that, you know, maybe that had a mental effect on him. How could it not have a mental effect? Do you know what I mean? Ricky Atten talked about it when he got knocked out by Pacquiao and it took so long to wake up. Like, surely as a fight, it, it takes a mental effect. But again, it's easy to say that. But this weekend, we've seen glimpses of him when he was blasting him all over and doing what, mm -hmm. like, how we planned the fight to go, he took about an Iden in the first round. I said, pull your shit together, come on. And he did. He started pinging Drikas everywhere. So we've seen glimpses of the old Darren. And then in the third, he went back to the first. So with Darren, I did get him in with my mind coach, but it was one session. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. I think Darren now could definitely do with the mental edge. How much pressure comes on fighters, not just with the training and putting everything in, knowing that you can fight, but how much does the mental stuff come into play with fighters? Like to, to break that, those barriers to think, shit, I could die here, I could get fucking any, so much things can go wrong. Like, how much battle do you go with your mind like before fights and after fights? Yeah, a lot. Well, like you say, you're putting your whole health on the line. Mm -hmm. Like me cornering Darren this weekend was a massive eye opener because I've cornered a lot of people, but I've never cornered at that level. And when I was like watching him warm up and we was about to do the walk, I was looking in his eyes, mate, and I was fucking so nervous. Could barely breathe. I was like, Cause you know, you want it so much for that person. And like, it's okay when I'm just going in there and I'm doing it. But when, you, when you're when on the outside and you're watching somebody else, it was horrible, mate. And I was thinking, I know his kids, I know his missus, I know everything that's on the line. I know all the naysayers and all the, the negativity that comes with being a fighter. And watching it from the outside, I was thinking, I was like, why do I do this? I was like, why am I still doing this? Do you know what I mean? Me and Darren have these chats, we go, are we fucking right in the head? Like we've made a few quid now. Like, we're all right. People know who we are. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're not struggling, mm -hmm. but we still love it. It's something that's deep inside us. We were born to do it. And like, as much as I've seen a recent Fury interview saying the same thing, I'm, I tried to retire, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what the fuck's wrong with us, mate? You tell me, because I don't know as much as anyone. Yeah, it's that adrenaline. Hopefully he bounces back. Hopefully he's just, that's a street learning curve. He comes back fitter and stronger because he seemed to have put it in this camp. He seemed to have done well and, had the mindset and talking right, but again, as what it is, and if anybody's going to come back, he'll come back. How was your training for this run up to this final? Like, what goes in your mind knowing that everything's in line? What did the loser get? Fuck all. 50k. So it's 950k difference. Like, what's going how, how do you then think to yourself? 50k for the loser, like, and a million straight for the winner. That's fucking big difference, isn't it? Like, <laughs> so what are you thinking then going into that? Like, did you feel more added pressure? Like this can change your life or was it kind of, sometimes you get too much pressure, you actually just become numb and actually feel better. Like how, was you, how were you getting into it? So 
I had this caption leading up to the fight, like I said before, get rich or die trying. So my plan was get rich or die trying. So I've never trained that hard for a fight. I, I was, there was times I was driving home and I was just crying. I was like, fucking hell. I'd be training three times a day. I was, I had this intense strength and conditioning program. I was sparring the best guys in the world, but I was just knocking everybody out in sparring. I was doing my mental stuff. I was hitting record personal best on weights and tracks. And it was like the world had just aligned for me and gone, it's your fucking time, lad. Mm -hmm. It's your time. And I started to believe it was my time. And it was Madison Square Garden. It was my whole friends and family. It was Channel 4. It was the whole world was watching this moment. Like, will this kid actually prevail? Because I remember BBC did an article on me and it pissed me off, mate. And the title was Brendan Lockney, the nearly man. And I thought, how can I retire? Because I'm 33 now, mate. I just turned 33 last week. And it's like... I can't retire now without winning a world title. I just can't. Like, how close I've been. 26 and 4 as a pro. Like, I've had more fights than Leon. I've had more fights than Darren. I've had more fights than all of them. And I've been mm. around the game forever. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, I fucking deserve this. And I started to proper believe it. Mm. And then when I walked over to Madison Square Garden and I had the fight, I started nudging my coach and everyone around me because there wasn't one butterfly. There wasn't any nerves. And I was getting really, really worried about not being nervous because I'm always nervous. But I think... I believed it that much and I was so adamant that it was my time that it just happened how it happened and there wasn't one bit of nerves, not one bit of doubt. I knew for a fact he wasn't going to beat me in my head for a fact. Even when he started catching me with a few shots, I started going, oh yeah, is that all you got? I was just so in the moment that nothing was taking it away from me and then the moment when it was stopped and it was waved off and it was actually done. I can't even, it, that's the most indescribable feeling in the world mate i wish i could put a word on it but i can't were you worried about his wrestling because he's one of the best on the planet is he not best wrestler in mma they say like he, like beat jordan burrows beat david taylor who are the two best wrestlers in america and no not one bit mate like even in the training company not to i had world-class russians and none of them were taking me down and, and everyone's like how are you stopping all these i've always had a natural knack for wrestling and i met a load of random iranians here 10 years ago and they just showed me wrestling inside out mate and a lot of people don't know that my wrestling's better than my striking. So when these wrestlers are, are looking at me, I look quite small compared to them and they're going, well, just pick him up and throw him around. But since the last two guys that I fought have been world-class wrestlers, they both found out it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. So see in that fight then, when you know your whole life's in the line, like how many, what round did you realise, okay, listen, I've got him, because did he not take a breather because it kicked in the balls, that like, kind of wasting time? Like, were you thinking, I've got him? Or are you thinking... I don't want him coming back stronger after an extra bit of breath, but what were you thinking? I'm not joking now. I knew from the start, from before the bell rang, because I just knew that I was willing to die and I was dead certain that he was either going to stretch me out or give me a million dollars. And like, when the fight started going as it was going, I just knew and then I kicked him in the leg. Oh, it might have been the balls. He reckons it was. And then he turned away from me and I looked at him and went, listen, you little pussy, let's get on with it. And he's looking at me like that and he turned around, he went, all right, let's go then. And then the ref went, do you want to go? And he went, no, give me another minute. And I just knew, I thought, you don't want to fight. Mm -hmm. You've been hurt. And like, you're trying to get a breather now. And from then, when he did start it again, I just threw the pressure on him from that moment because I knew he was folding. But he's your friend, is he not? You two are very close. Was that Top correct? guy, mate. How hard is that then? Very to, hard. To take that life-changing money away from somebody else as well. Like, are you thinking, fuck it, like, this is a business? Or are you... Do you feel sad for them? Because he's got family as well, Let he? me tell you how much of a good guy Bubba Jenkins is, right? I was out the, the next day on the pints, right? He rings me, he, he messaged me, um, call me. So I call him and he goes, imagine this, mate. He's just lost that million dollars and he's at home and he's in a bad way. And he goes, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you. I just want to congratulate you and tell you how much you deserve that belt, mate. I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, you really do. He said, I followed your career. I had to watch all your fights and you deserve that belt, mate. I was like, fucking hell. And he was like, yeah. And then he uh, he come and met me. I met. I took him for lunch in Vegas when I, when I cornered Darren a, week, a day before. He lives in Vegas. It was three weeks after the fight, mate. He came and met me. He's still a complete mess, mate. He couldn't walk. He's on crutches. His head was fucked. He brought his missus with him. And um, there was one distinct moment in the back where we're both in the back. The doctors are, are treating us. And his three kids came in the room. And I've like got up to try and hug his kid. And they've ran away like, no, no, no. Like scared of me. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, fucking hell. And like, he was asking him what day it was. He didn't know what day it was. He was proper foot mate. And I was like, I was wounded. Cause I'm thinking, I didn't even celebrate in the changing room. Cause I'm looking at him. Imagine some guys just made his dream happen. And another guy's is just broke. And his three kids and his family are with him in this in this thing with the doctors. And I'm just looking at him like, 
fucking hell. And then this is how much of a good guy he is. Again, I was chatting with him um, when we went for lunch and he said, I said, mate, that, that broke me, you know, when I seen your kids and they didn't even want to acknowledge me and they were scared of me. I said, he said, listen, Brendan, he said, I'm glad he got to see that. He went, because 95% of the time I win. So he said, I'm glad I got to teach him a lesson about life. Just imagine he's saying this to me, that you don't always get to win. Mm -hmm. And like, you have to work hard for stuff and sometimes you can work hard and it still don't go your way. That's mad, isn't it? Mad, mate. That's how much of a good guy he is. Yeah, see when you win, like what's, what's going through your mind? Can you remember much? The doll, mate. Is that all? It was the doll. It was, it, it's like, what, a mill? He's going to be in my bank tomorrow. Tax free? <laughs> well, allegedly. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're on my case, mate. But... Yeah. Yeah, can you imagine like 50k or a mil? Mm -hmm. Look at the difference in that. And like when they waved it off, I just knew I didn't have to punish him anymore. All the injuries and all the years that I went through. And when he, when the ref did this and I turned mm -hmm. around and I was just like, it's over. Mm -hmm. If I don't want to fight again, I don't have to. Even though I love it, but realistically, I don't yeah. have to now. Like I can flip that mill now and I can invest it right. And it's like, like I was chatting to Bubba again. And he's like, I have to do it again now. I'm looking at fucking, fucking hell, man. Seriously. Yeah. What was, what was more important, winning the belt or the money? That's a question that I get asked all the time, but I went back and forth leading up to it. And then in the press conference after, like, what's more? And I went, the performance was better than them both. Like, to be able to go in there and dismantle one of the best wrestlers in MMA and do it the way I did. I'm a proper martial artist, me, and I love martial arts and I love negating people's strengths like I knew he was a wrestler and he didn't get me down once and like being able to do that I was so happy with myself internally that none of that mattered yet mm -hmm. that was just like fuck it what do you mean he didn't take me down and I landed the shots that I drilled and that my coach that I had with me is the same guy that taught me my first punch when I was 15 years old can you imagine mm -hmm. and he's been on this journey with me now all the way up until the world title and he got to lift the belt mate, and he fucking cried his eyes out and I've never seen him drop a tear in his life mate and there's a moment where what PFL put on where we're both in the cage just like we fucking did it mm -hmm. it's emotional what was your training camp like? like what is a day routine like when you're training for a big fight like that well I get off mostly like I did my last camp in England but then this one I find distractions in England I find like people will ring you for stupid shit and I get involved in stupid shit in England so I try and get away as much as I can. So I went to Thailand. I went on my own, mate. It's on my own, but I already know all the coaches there. It would typically entail getting up in the morning, about nine o'clock, go to the gym, do a 10 o'clock session. That'd be about 10, an hour and a half. I'd go home, eat, rest, and then I'd do a session in the evening. I was big on my yoga in this one. I'm very big on yoga. Um, my nutrition's always bang on point. I never cheat, even outside of training. My nutrition is very important to me. I slept eight to nine hours every single day. I hydrated. I didn't cut one corner. When I say I didn't cut a corner, I didn't cut a fucking corner, mate. I didn't have less than eight hours sleep. I didn't have a chocolate bar because I was that determined to get it, mate. I thought I would never forgive myself if I did cheat and lead up to it, and I didn't. And I think when the cage door locked on that night, I knew that I'd done everything, and that there's no better feeling for a fighter than that. Mm -hmm. So if you did, you did get beat, there's no feeling sorry for yourself yeah. what about semen retention and that i know boxers don't wank or fucking anything for like six weeks eight weeks of that did it, do you do that stuff i fucked about a lot with that young guy Does that work? Younger, but this time i did i, I stuck by that as well for for, the, for this mm. season I, like if there was a law or there was something that could have helped mm -hmm. i did it mate like oh, yeah. hyperbaric chambers scran um yoga you name it mate like sunlight this i was doing anything anything if someone said that helps i did it so the semen retention thing I've done a bit of research on that. Some say it's folklore. Mm -hmm. Some say it's one of them superstitious things. Um, whatever it is, mate, I did it. So if you're an aspiring fighter out there, get it done. Yeah, no, because people talk about negatives about vegan, vegetarian, sunlight. There's so much. It's just what, what works for you. And it clearly worked for you. Everything you've done, it aligned. You were always in the brinks of greatness anyway. Mm -hmm. It just so happens it's came to that time and that night where you'd achieved everything you set out for. It was winning a world title, being a millionaire. But that's a fucking amazing thing and whatever you've done what you just don't want to be telling people now man because they'll be fucking copying your routine so you went up at four in the morning running the streets and doing all the mad stuff you're that's getting... all a load of bollocks as that's well that's it yeah I mean I think you watch your Rocky films that kind of stuck with me if you need one for a fight you should be out running the streets at four in the morning I just think that like every fighter is different and here's my model and I stick by it a happy fighter is a dangerous mm -hmm. fighter and if you're happy if your missus is not giving you shit if 
your training partners are all sound and you've got tunes on at the gym and you're bouncing, if you're content with your opponent and you do your research, you do your research like, right, he throws a jab, if I jab that way. If you've got good, solid coaches that are really behind you and like they've been in the game a long time, there's pure Mickey Mouse coaches out there, mate. Mickey Mouses who just proper blag it. And if all that is in line, I just think, I think your team's very important. I think that a lot of people struggle because they're guided by the wrong things. And especially mm. like the missus thing that I said is, is also very important. I see fighters barneying with the birds all the way through camp. And they go, I'm not going to train today. My head's done in. So I think it's a combination of a very lot of things. And I say that I've also had the worst training camps of my life and performed great as well. I've had the best training camps and performed shit. So fighting such a mad thing. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, you get locked in a cage for 15 minutes and have a scrap. But the six weeks that lead up to that 15 minutes, it could go terrible or it could go fantastic. Like I, I was fortunate to not be injured in my last two fights at the PFL. But if I was, it's fucking horrible, mate. Imagine you going in with half a knee snapped in half and you can barely walk, but you've got to go and fight some other lunatic. Mm -hmm. Injuries are a big thing in this game and a lot of people have suffered from them. What was your nutrition like? How many calories? Or is, it, is it all just straight to the, the, the one cal to, right to the percentage of how many calories? Or do you just eat when you're hungry? Like, were you, did you have a proper nutritionist or are you so used to doing it yourself? Yeah, I've got a nutritionist. Um, shout out to Dan. And uh, there's a place in Thailand called Pure Prep. There's also Box Co in Manchester. So whenever I go anywhere now, I've never really focused on it too much, but the last two camps, again, I did. And I, I rang up the Pure Prep because Thai, Thai food's terrible, mate. It's all cooked in shit, mate. So you can't, yeah, so you can't eat mm. it. So I found a, a Pure Prep they were called. Went on it for six weeks, got dropped up my gaff every morning. They're the three things you've got to eat for this day. There's your watermelon snack before a session. Stuck to it. And again, the results. How important is it then to stick to a plan? Because you see people slipping in camps one night, two nights, still drinking, still eating shit, and then they have to cut mass weight the night before that. How important is it to just stay focused and stay disciplined? Like you say, that's probably the best camp you've ever had, but look at the results. Mm. But, well, here's what I tell people as well. Camp, you only train for six hours a day max, right? So it's 24 hours in a day. I tell people it's not the training, it's the shit you do outside of training. Yeah. People fuck about, they think because they've done a great session, you can go and eat chips and then have a pint after training and go and do stupid shit. Mate, it's it's a full, it's a 24 hours a day, seven days a week job. I'd leave session, yeah? I won't answer my phone. I had my phone on airplane mode for 90% of that camp. I would leave training. I'd go and eat my pure prep. I'd get in bed. I'd put on YouTube, Jane's English podcast. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> Get him on. Sleep, get up, train again, sleep. And again, I didn't, fuck with that routine once I didn't come out of it for anything I didn't miss one nap I didn't miss anything so and again the result so you won that then now you're sitting million quid got the belt back home how long are you back for I leave again on Sunday because you've done interviews with your own big aerial how was he legend you know him yeah I spoke to him well, not have you talked to him a few times yeah. Twice, yeah but how's how was that interview like in New York and kind of loving it and getting all the promotion because you were everywhere as soon as you won that. How was that, all the attention? Were you used to that? Or has it been different this time? Has it been different, huh? I'd say I've been on aerial probably about nine times now. Mm -hmm. It's the first time I've been in studio. Um, mate, can I say, what a guy Ariel Awani is, mate. He, he, he pulled me on before the Contender Series because of all the madness, Fiori and all that. He's thinking, what, Fiori sending out, go on, Brendan and mm -hmm. Rashford and the United team and everyone's doing it. He's got wind of that and pulled me on the show off that. And then since then he pulled, and then obviously that that got attention. And then when it didn't go my way, he went, can you come back on? And he went, be honest, lad, what's going on there? And I couldn't tell him, I didn't know what had gone on. And then ever since then, he's followed my career. And then PFL have gone, lad, you've got a media storm. Like yesterday, I did seven back to back. Imagine this, I landed in Heathrow at nine in the morning, got picked up, got took to BBC, Sky Sports News, The Zone, Telegraph, one after another, had to do the belt, had to do everything, and then got on the road back to Manchester, got in my bed for 11 o'clock at night, from eight in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, and I've just been absolutely flat out today again, loads, yourself, and it's like, I'm made for it though, I can sit and talk in front of these all day, I like this just as much as fighting, so mm -hmm. PFL are all over that now, they're going, listen, they were dying for me to win that, they needed an English champion, mm -hmm. someone that can have a chat, 
and start drawing more fighters towards it. And I will pick them up and I will bring more fighters because they deserve it as a promotion. Yeah, you've got to pick them up. Just fucking give you a million quid. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Fuck's sake, you've got to be up with something dick. I know, I know. I'm going to get a bit if they're over the million Go quid. Go on, lad. <laughs> it's fucking class. Like, I, I, I never heard of the company until just, 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 that comp just that contender series there that you were on. I, I never heard of them. So how, where have they came from? So they call a professional fighters league. Uh -huh. the, uh, they've been going for about four seasons now. Right. They initially tried to get me about four seasons ago before the contender. And when I got a phone call about it, oh, this is company, they're giving out mills. You hear this all the time in MMA. Someone's coming along to give out mills and mm -hmm. it's just a blag or they don't pay you at the end and they go bust. But they did one season, I watched it. Second season, I watched it and it was sick. Started getting big fighters, Pettis and Rory, Vadum. They started getting all these big names. I was like, and then after the contender, you know, they, they weren't sore about me turning them down for the contender. They were like, I said, listen, I've always watched being UFC, I'm doing the contender. And they went, go and do your thing, bro. We'll always be here. Did it straight after it. Not only did they take me back, they doubled what they were going to give me before the contender. And mm. I was like, fucking hell. Then I did the first season with them. And I think the biggest thing for me is they got the Channel 4 deal because nobody in England could watch the fights. Yeah, it was on ESPN in America and everyone was watching it there. But mm. my fan base is here and nobody could watch it. And... I just begged the owner, I'm like, lad, get me an English deal, get me some telly over here. And he rang me up and he was like, we got your Channel 4, how about that, mate? And I was fucking buzzing, mate. It's, that's what's to turn the corner from in the UK. And I'm absolutely buzzing now. Like, although it was three in the morning, it did amazing numbers. And the pay-per-view in, in America did amazing numbers. Just shows that it's catching on. And there's room for two big promotions in MMA, there really is. It's that big now. There's enough room for everybody. Look at the boxing promoters, there's fucking about three billion of them. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? Like, if boxers, it's, ju it's just bringing in the crowds in, it's bringing in the pay-per-view, which is where the money is. And But if you've got a company that's willing to pay out just as much as they make, then that's the company you fight for. Do you know what I mean? If you're in the, I'm not just to try to bring down the UFC, but all the fighters complain about money. <laughs> Unless you're a Conor McGregor or a fucking John Jones, or you're, you're just barely surviving. Risking your life, you'd be cheaper off just fucking going doing a nine to five, staying well, safer and making more money. It's hard to discredit the UFC, mate, because they've made the sport what it is. Mm -hmm. I can't discredit Dana for what he's done for the sport because he's made it what it is. He really has. So have the UFC. But these are big players in town now. And they've also started this new model that I'll tell you about that. They're doing pay-per-view. So they were going to do Kayla Harrison against Cyborg. Everyone wanted to see that fight. And they're doing this pay-per-view revenue share now. So they take 50 and they give you 50. Have you ever heard of that before? No. So they're going to do these pay-per-views and say, let's say it sells, I don't know, 100,000 and it's $50 a go. The fighter gets half. The two fighters that are fighting get half of it and they get half. Since they've released that, mate, all the fighters are like, what? So imagine you're a McGregor who's getting two, three million pay-per-view buys at $50 and you're getting half of it. Mm -hmm. Usually you'll get a dollar off it. In the UFC, you get a dollar, two dollars. But if you're getting $25, mate, like they're changing the game. They're very innovative, innovative even the cage, the, what they use. They use a lot of metrics and I just really like them, mate, but it's not for the faint-hearted. Six months, you've got to fight four times. UFC, mm -hmm. you're lucky if you get two a year, mate. Mm -hmm. Six months, four fights. Everybody's going in there madly injured because of the last one. You can't miss a date. And it's innovative, it's new, it's exciting. And again, with the Channel 4 deal and the new English fighters at the signing, I think they're going to do really well. If the PFL come in and say, look, another competition next year, one against two million, or Dana White comes in with a contract, five fights, who do you go with? I stick where my bread's buttered. Yeah. Because I've I've already spoke with these and there's astronomical numbers getting thrown, thrown around just to fight next year. So with Kayla losing... Last year, I believe I'm the face of the company now. Pettis, Pettis is out of it now. Rory and Redoom and all these big names that they signed. They just find it really hard, mate. It's really fucking, it's really hard belt to get just because of the activity. Imagine like, I have to cut 20 to 30 pound every six weeks. Even that alone, people take six months to get that sort of weight off. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's not for the faint hearted, mate. And anyone that signs with PFL, I won't want to say it, but you, you are signing your life away for seven months. I don't think you're going to be doing anything in between these fights because you're fighting again every six weeks. So it's difficult. But again, we're here. We're at the end of it. It's time to reevaluate and see where we go from here. Do you think you're at the peak of your career now? I must be. And again, at 33, yeah. people peak in MMA much later. You look at the list of UFC champions. 36, 37, yeah. 38. Isn't it mad? Why is that? I, I can't tell you that either. Footballers are retiring at 33, 34. <laughs> their prime is a fucking and we're 20s. we're fighting. Yeah. 
Why is that? Is that experience? Experience. And again, I had my first fight at 17, 16 years old. And at 33, I'm only just getting the rewards of this sport. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. Imagine how hard it was like when I wasn't getting anything for 16 years. And like, oh, he's knock back, knock back, knock back, knock back. And then just fucking kept going. And what, eventually it paid off. What made you keep going? I wish I could bottle it up and sell it. I wish I could bottle it up and tell you exactly what it is. But it must be something that's really deep inside me, mate. It must be. Yeah, that's a long time to give everything and just kind of surviving to, to believing that something big was going to happen. It's fucking mad, isn't it? Life's mad. Like. Especially after Dana. Yeah. Because where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. That's you, that's you then. Like, UFC is the mecca for us. Mm -hmm. So you get there and you get the door turned on you. And again, I just took, didn't take no for an answer and fought again three months later and kept going and going and going and going, believing that something would happen. And I think if I'm going to take any lesson out of my story, it's like, work hard, mate. Just mm -hmm. work hard because something will eventually happen. And like, I, I heard this saying years ago and it's true, like, what is done in the dark will always come to light. Mm -hmm. And I never thought it was. And everyone, like all these world champions that I used to train with, used to watch me out train them all and think, fucking hell, that kid's unlucky. But I wasn't unlucky. It just wasn't my time yet. How many things, Jenk, you've got left? Loads, mate. I, I just feel like it. Unstoppable than now? At the minute, yeah. I do feel like that. I feel like I'm, I'm right at the peak of my career, but I don't want to do it too long and I don't want to be that guy that's in the cage too long and... I have to reevaluate my goals because I've got my world title and my bank account's healthy. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, what are you doing it for now? Are you doing it to please others? Are you doing it to see how far you can go? Are you doing it to see what level of fighter you can actually beat? Like, that's something that I need to really evaluate because it's it's not it's very fresh in my mind now still. But yeah. again, them pictures, the belt, I had it all around my house. I can rip them down now. It's time to put new things up, but what they are, I don't know yet. How hard is it to stop though when you're getting offered seven figure sums? Like does that then become impossible to stop? Because now you're at that stage where you don't just change your life, but everybody around you's life. All the fucking hangers are in it. But you know what I mean? Like kids mm. and their kids, like this money changes. It's just how you invest it, of course. But how hard does it then become in 35, 36? The big money's there. You're still at top of the tree. Like, why should anybody stop though for that at the top? Like you're only just getting started. In my eyes, yeah. the way you are fighting there, it's a fucking good thing. So right now you're coming up to Christmas and... You've got another year, a new year coming. It's exciting times, especially when you're achieving things in life. You don't ever want to stop, but the test of a man is when the shit hits the fan, when they've got nothing to get up for, when they've no drive, when they've no motivation, then what are you going to do then? But right now you're at that moment where you can, whatever path you choose, you can you can do it with your head held high. But 33 then, just turn 33. Nah, you've got many years, mate, innit? I'm at that stage of my life where I could touch this now and it turns to gold. Mm -hmm. I'm at that where ev everything's going right. Listen, mate, you're sitting in this podcast, mate, so fuck the million pounds. Okay, that's the about belt, time, mate. man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're fucking lucky stars at that light, mate. <laughs> fuck the money in the belt, mate. This is a golden show, mate. Well, mate. This is your belt. But so how do you then, how do you kick on from this? Um, Does that add more pressure on because of now what you're achieving? Or does it then release the pressure? I think getting that has released so much pressure because again I, I was having words with myself like imagine just retiring and not actually achieving anything after everything that i'd done mm -hmm. in it and again bbc doing an article the nearly man and everyone just knew me as that guy that got fucked off by dana white and i thought imagine that's your story your story is the guy that was good enough but got all the doors shut in his face and i just couldn't let that happen the nearly man's about harsh man it's not as if you're fucking losing world titles and you only get fucking fucked from a company like who who wrote that tagline i went mad mate i, I tagged him in it on twitter i said you cheeky bastard they're the, the nearly man do you know what i've been through my career 26 and four as a pro 14 knockouts i've got four losses three of them are split decisions all of them could have gone either way i've never been knocked out never been submitted mm -hmm. and you're calling me the nearly man i fought in every promotion on planet earth in every country mm -hmm. it, it pissed me off mate it did so that's why i needed that to show people like that guy that wrote that article no, I'm not the nearly man, and I can yeah. achieve things. Mm -hmm. What do you think the state of British boxing is now? Do you think we've got a lot of good fighters coming through? British boxing's is fucked, though, isn't it? Like, they, they don't make the big fights, do they? Why is that? Why like, is that? The difference with MMA and PFL, they ring me and go, you're fighting blah, blah on this date, and you don't have a choice. You don't say, well, my promoter said this, I want more money. You sign up for the PFL, you sign up for UFC, you get a name and a date, mate. I love that. Mm-hmm. They go, right, this, you and him would be a good fight. What, he's not lost in nine years. 
what is the world class this is world class that's sweet and we just get on with it as MMA fighters mm -hmm. and we roll the dice yeah sometimes you lose so what do you know what I mean like in boxing it just seems very guarded by politics and they don't even fight anyone until the 20 and 0 yeah. they fight big men until the 20 and 0 and it's like mm -hmm. you get rolled in the UFC or the PFL or these big MMA promotions once you're in you're in you could be fighting absolutely anyone and I think that's why people are turning towards don't get me wrong I'm a massive boxing fan Same. I had a boxing match not long ago I'm I'm a big oh, on your show what yeah, about yeah, 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 no. what yeah, yeah, yeah. about that yeah. that was some experience yeah, wasn't it, that's how we first met yeah, yeah 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 so we met on a changing route <laughs> yeah <laughs> how was your experience of boxing give me your experience yeah I was fucking scared, mate. What's your life? Fighting in front of thousands, mate. I first ever fight, mate. Michael Buffer calling me into the ring. Michael Buffer. Do you know what I mean? I'm thinking, what the fuck? Well, I was getting paid good, though. And yeah. It was just an experience I always wanted to do because every man thinks they can fight. I put everything into the training and then as soon as I went out there the first round, I blew. Did you I go was corners? fucked. I was shattered. Did you cut any corners? Yeah. Yeah. In the cab? Yeah. Yeah, because I think it's... <laughs> Because, it's an hard life isn't yeah, it James yeah. because I was expecting because I was sparring I was doing 8 rounds of 3 and I was like this is only like 3 twos or 4 twos, whatever it was but the first round I blew and it, just the energy the nerves and everything I still won it but still you watch back and you think fuck me like you're all over the gaff. Like for any amateur fighter, anybody that's just, you, you do cringe. I'm not daft, do you know what I mean? I don't like to think, oh, I could be a world contender here. You watch back and think, fucking hell, man. Like, <laughs> I'm just proud that I went in and done it. Because the guy I was fighting was fucking solid. Was he, like? he was a bodybuilding champion. Like he's won many fucking things, so he's a winner. But I've just got that Scottish mentality, man. Like yeah, I just yeah. got kind of got that psychotic shit. And I want to do another couple next year because the money's good. And I know a lot of people slag these sort of shows, but it pays my bills I've got for kids to feed it's good mm. for my name it promotes my brand I'm just a Scottish guy do you know what I mean so it's try to get accepted all around mm. the UK until I go to America but I've got so much respect for people to fight because you used to watch boxing and think throw a jab do more <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell man I just wanted to cut a lot and die oh, mate. I just want I kept thinking man is it what round is this I just wanted the belt to go there's, and then Enjoy. you think then I kept hearing my coach or I could hear my sister or, or my brother you can hear people shouting and you can go but the fucking level of respect you have for anybody that fights I don't give a fuck what level you're at mm, that true. takes balls man like and then you kind of think you're a fighter after that you're shadow boxing in the house oh. and that you're, you think you can take on any cunt but yeah it was a good experience but I'll do it again fair play to you mate like yeah. getting in there I say to anyone like imagine what you just did there for 16 years, mate. That's what I've been doing. That has been yeah. my life. Yeah. Opponent after opponent, after diet, after all that. But the boxing, mate, fucking hell, the experience. Like, he, he, I've never had a boxing match. That was my first one. Mm -hmm. And I know the promoter, and he was just like, listen, I'll actually get you a proper boxing match. I've got celebs on there, but we'll get you a proper boxing or a boxing match. And it was like three weeks' notice. I thought, fucking hell, of course. Yeah. I've always wanted to box at the MEN as well. I've headlined it for MMA, and then I got to do it for boxing. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So I was like, yeah, sweet. But mate, the range is all different. The gloves, I was getting hit by the gloves. It felt like sponges yeah. compared to what I'm yeah. getting it with. I thought, well, is that it? Mate, what an experience boxing was. So yeah, fair play to you, mate. And yeah. you're supposed to fight Frankie as well, weren't you? Yeah. I know Frankie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened when that when the show went under? Went under second one, wasn't it? <clears throat> but I think they think these shows are going to be bigger than what they are. Nobody's asked. A lot of these like, so-called celebrities, it's not like young girls following them, but they're not interested. Their followers ain't interested in boxing. They're not fighters. So I think they lose money. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Oh, like, definitely lost so the, the, He thought he was going to sell the MEM. Yeah, just didn't, nah. Did like, fucking boxers now struggle. Professional to sell out. I know. A lot of people are struggling now, mate. Mm. Like, they've not got 40, 50 quid to go and buy tickets and watch fucking nobody's fighting. Do you it's know true. what I mean? I wouldn't go and watch these events. I was just happy to get the payday and, and promote the brand, working with a so-called celebrities, you know what I mean? But for me, it was just a, with a the family there and something to tick off the list, man. But <laughs> Even Bez was on there and everything. Yeah, he gets get sparked out, mate. Like, happy oh, Monday. Yeah, that was my concern, though, getting knocked out. Was it? Yeah. Why? Just ego in it, embarrassment, yeah. shame, bigging yourself up and just some cunts cracking you. Flattered. Yeah. But then what I noticed was I, I used to be scared sparring, not scared, but overthinking. And I felt as if I had to force it. But after two or three weeks, I started to enjoy getting hit. I started to enjoy the taste of blood in my mouth. I started to enjoy it. And that, that kind of worried me. I thought, fuck me, man. Like, I'm 38, like, and I'm enjoying it. But like, that scared me. I said, that don't go away, that feeling, you know. You know, when you drive it to the gym, I still get butterflies about sparring. 
Yeah, why, like, what is that? None of that goes away because the thing, like, there's so much pressure, like, sparring's the most important thing for a fighter in my eyes. And when you're going to that sparring session, that can either make or break your day and your confidence. Because I had, like, 17 and 1 Russians that I was sparring, yeah? And if it didn't go my way, I'd get hurt, so I'd be driving to the gym. And these were going for it. I was in Thailand, mate, so I didn't even have a coach with me. Mm -hmm. And I'd turn up and it was a straightener, basically. I'd be driving to the gym and be thinking, my belly would be going and all that. And like, I've been doing it forever. Yeah. So that feeling that you're on about, mm. it never, ever disappears. The training, you're still nervous rocking up to sparring. You're still nervous rocking up to fight. Because people always say, you've been doing it ages now. It must just be everything sweet now. And is it fuck sweet? No, is it fuck? Because my coach used to get me people who'd had fights, amateur fights. So I used to think, give me some cunt easy, man. <laughs> just let me batter some cunt, man. Bring anybody in. Like, I didn't manage to see yours. What happened? Yeah, one point. How, how did it point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you take I won every round. round. He got, he got um, deducted one as well. Because I think he used to do rugby and shit. So he kind of swung his about and that. Try to intimidate him. Yeah, that? because he, in his mind, because he, he was ripped. I'm going there with a fucking little belly, a set of tits, kind of. And he obviously, in his mind, is this is easy. And obviously it's, it's not that easy, do you know what I mean? I'm Scottish. So you went to this local boxing gym in Scotland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I worked with, I went to see Josh Warrington, Crawler, like they were all just bits and bobs all around the Did country. Nice. Yeah, just a wee hour here and just, it was only amateur, mate, it was a fucking... No, but it don't matter, mate. Yeah. What you did, you got in a fight in front of a lot of people. A, thousand, a few thousand there, aye. There was, mate, and it yeah. was a top atmosphere. I fought in a lot of places. That was a buzz. Mm -hmm. That whole show was a buzz coming out. There was a good energy in there that night yeah, and there was a right buzz about it. It's just a shame they didn't fill it a bit more and didn't progress with the show. Yeah. It really was. Yeah, like I said, I don't think these shows do as great as what people set out. But again, you've got to take your hat off to anybody trying. So where do you go forward for the future, brother? Like, tell me, what's the plans? I'm round the bend at the minute. Are you? Yeah, I'm fucking in Manchester. Absolutely loving it. I've only been back a day, but I'm just, I'm just still ecstatic, mate. I went for a coffee this morning in my local foot. Me, even the bin men are fucking pulling over. It was mad, I was telling you off air then, like, people are stopping the car and um, it's about time someone from this area made it, that's what they're all saying. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm from not the nicest place, do you know yeah. what I mean? And I'm going home with a million dollars and a big fat belt where people are lucky to get a job, mm. do you know what I mean? And like, to be able to do what I've done without any real help, I just did it off just hard work and sheer determination. There was no mm. handouts, nobody give me an handout, mate. Yeah. And like, to go back there now, seeing that I've achieved what I've achieved, it's great for the youngsters, mate. And mm -hmm. like the ones that are like, fucking hell, maybe I can. Yeah, it is one in a million to do it. It is, mm -hmm. but it's been done. Yeah. You just got to get your head down and get after it. And I think helping them sort of people out and um, I just, just like I say, I'm at the peak of my career now and I just feel invincible and unbeatable. Mm -hmm. So PFL don't start again till April next year. So it's kind of like, I, I put my full life on old James. Like I don't have a gaff. I don't. My birds all in turmoil, my me, uh, me family life's in turmoil. My, all I do is fight. Everything else is absolutely fucked. My mm -hmm. life outside of fight, I don't have a life outside of fighting. I wake up in the morning now and I'm like, what do I do? Because I'm not training. And like, I, I'm spending this time now to get all that in order because I can just go and buy a gaff cash now. Yeah. Sweet, there you go. So like, I'm spending the next two months really putting my life back into order. Yeah, because you've done a lot. That's what people don't realise. It's the sacrifices that come with it. The misery, the, not being with your loved ones. Like, obviously fighting is different from what I do, but what I'm, I'm constantly on the road, constantly trying to achieve something and make something to provide for the family, to mm. put them into good schools, to put roof over their heads, to start businesses where everybody around me succeeds. But I question it also because then I'm missing the most important part and that's spending time with them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? That was London, two or three days and then Manchester, Liverpool, back home, spend a bit of family time in Christmas, then it's straight back on the road. Like, you can't take the foot off the gas in anything in life, no matter if you're a fighter, a fucking podcast host, or a bin man. Like, we've constantly got bills to pay and we've constantly got new triggers and whatever it is that goes on in life, but it's just to keep going, no matter who you are. Like, is that where you struggle when you've got too much free time? Well, leading up to this thing, I missed my best friend's wedding, one of my best mates' wedding, um, and then... Imagine this, yeah. My mate died the day before the fight. The way he died, right? And nobody told me because they didn't want to tell me. I found out after the fight, scrolling through Instagram, that someone had put an RIP post on. I turned to me. I went, "What the fuck?" She went, "Oh, we couldn't tell you till after the fight." Cried my eyes out. I just been to his funeral then. Literally, literally come to hear from the funeral, and it's like I missed all that. I missed the weddings, missed the funerals, missed the birthdays. Mm -hmm. I miss all these social events. I'm just on my own in Thailand, mate. 
And like, people don't see what it takes to get this stuff. They think, oh yeah, he's just gifted. He's talented. I hate the word talent. You're not talented. You fucking work hard, are you? Mm -hmm. Stories about the stuff that Ronaldo does to be able to become the best in the world. And mate, I work all day, every day. This is 24 hours a day, seven day a week job. And now that I've stepped away and like, I've got a bit of time off to leave, but I'm just completely lost. Mm -hmm. I'm like walking around my house thinking of stuff to do. And that's the thing with like what Fiori said, like I can't retire. And it's scary when he says that because I resonated with what he says mm -hmm. because we've been that institutionalized and programmed into this sport and into fighting. It is scary to think, well, there is 24 hours a day in a day because I don't see any of them. Yeah. Like my mates get up at nine, uh, go to work at nine and come home at five. And after that five, they're switching off, aren't they? They're, they're mm. with the family, they're with the kids. Me, mate, you think I can't do that? So I've lived a crazy, crazy life. Don't get me wrong, it's the best thing that ever happens to me, but it's also got a lot of flaws that come with it. And like I say, I've got two or three months now to actually try and get a few things in order before the next turnaround. Do you get a come down after a fight? Because I've had boxers on, I've had comedians on, some of them are suicidal after events, like because it's such highs are performing and then crashing down. Do you struggle after a fight? Or no, you I'm still, still on, on a high now? Yeah. Can you tell? Yeah. I'm still on a massive... Are you like that every fight? Uh, nah, this one especially. But it's the performance. It's all in the performance. I've won fights and been pissed off. Said to my coach, that was shit, that. But I've, le I've levered the guy. Like I say, I, I watched the thing that Connor said. I lost my mind in the process. We like... We're that institutionalized and I'm that like focused on this thing that that performance means that much to me. Like if I would have won that belt, but I wouldn't have knocked him out and wouldn't perform the way I did, I'd still be half pissed off. But because I was able to put the performance in that I trained for, that's what gives me the elation that I've still got now. One of the biggest men on the planet, Conor McGregor, like, he was sharing all your stuff, man, showing love and support. How was that for you? He always has though, mate. He always has. He's always been in my DMs. Me and him chat quite regular. And he's a top guy, mate. And the thing is with Connor, he doesn't bullshit anyone and he doesn't big up any fighters. He doesn't like anyone, does he? But he sees me, the real, recognise the real. He sees the journey. And Connor's a real one, man. And it's mad that Connor McGregor's sweet got more love than me within the PFL. That's how big he is. Connor McGregor's bigger than this whole sport. So when he puts his stamp on it, mate, mm -hmm. that's when you know you've done something right, isn't it? Yeah. That's unbelievable. He took UFC to another level. I only watched it because of Conor McGregor, the law of attraction talk and the belief. Like his first few fights, he just oozed energy, something that was just something that drew you towards him to then winning two belts, to then fighting Mayweather, to then fighting fucking Nate Diaz, who's probably about 20, 30 pounds heavier. Like people hate on him for what? Because he's fucking schooled the majority of you and told you how to make money. Like, the guy took UFC to a whole fucking other level. That like, even when he comes back next year, he'll probably break his pay per view still. No matter. He's one of a kind. There'll never ever be a Conor McGregor again. He transcended a sport from imagine me as a fighter and people frowned upon you. Conor McGregor came along and everyone went, You do that Conor stuff, that stuff Conor does. And that's how much he changed the game. And we all owe so much to Conor McGregor. All these people that hate on Conor McGregor, how can you? He got us all bigger paydays. He got us all more notoriety. He really did. And like, mm. I see fighters just going at him. Me and, me and him have talked about it on, on Instagram. Certain fighters that have gone at him. And I'll, I'll DM him and go, fucking hell. I know, mate, can you imagine? Like, he's pissed off himself because he's put all these people on. He put the food on the table for us all. You can say what you want, but he actually did. Yeah, I think it's phenomenal what he achieved unbelievable and everything else he's done outside it the fighting like i say he's made himself he'll probably be a billionaire within the next few years man and that's why people are raging people are upset because they can't fucking get to those s certain heights but again it's it like you say you've got that you've got that british following as well mm -hmm. like you have got that following see when you won the million quid how many people second cousins and fucking great uncles and other people popping out the woodwork did anybody come forward straight away and say you've done amazing any chance to Giving us a loan, that. Oh, I got a right few GoFundMe pages anyway. I Did got you? fucking all sorts coming through. Uh, <laughs> I said, fucking hell, let the money land first. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but again, one of the main questions I kept getting asked is, right, well, what's the first thing you're going to buy? Go on, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mate, I've been in the PFL for two years now. Every fight I fight from, I get good dough. I've been making dough, do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's like, I've had dough. It's not like, yeah, a million on one night. It's astronomical, but like... I'm not a daft guy. I'm not going to go out and buy a Ferrari, mate, and fucking start driving the streets of Manchester. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sensible with the dough, and I know that I'm 33. There's another 33 years left minimum in me. Do you know what I mean? So that yeah. has to last, and I'll make it work for me. But people seem to think that, oh, 
I've come from never having anything to just getting a mill dropped in the yeah. account. But mm -hmm. uh, little did he know me, I've always done all right. I've always been a sensible lad. I've always invested well. I've got properties, I've done things. So now that's going to take me to a whole other level again. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Have you got any fighters you look up to? Connor's definitely one of them. Connor's definitely one of them. John Jones, greatest to ever. I think he's the greatest ever. Greatest to ever, ever. I actually met him before, not my last fight to fight before. We've got the same manager. And uh, he was training in one of the training rooms the day before my fight. And my manager was like, S just said it in conversation. He went, yeah, 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 John Jones, he's training in there. I said, he's training in there. He went, he's in there training. I went, he went, do you want to go meet him? I went, of course I want to go meet him. And then we've like walked in. He's got some mad music on. Like training with this guy anyway. He comes over, shakes my hand. And he's a fucking, what a presence, mate. I'm looking him up and down and thinking, you're the greatest man to ever do martial arts, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at him and then he gets chatting. And we've got the same manager and he's gone, how's he treating you? You know, but our manager went, well, it's up and down. He just started laughing. He's like, yeah, me too. And then um, we chatted for a bit. And at the end of it, he goes, you got a really good energy about you, Brendan. He said, I'm really looking forward to your fight tonight. And then I left there and I was just like, fucking hell, I've just been with John Jones. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And definitely, um, definitely look up to him. Peter Yan, another one. Peter Yan's one of my favourites. I've trained with Peter for years. One of the nicest, most humble champions that there's ever been. Um, so I'd say them three. Do you think John Jones will fight heavyweight next year? Fuck me when I seen him, lad. He's not going to light heavyweight again. He's massive. Is he? He's scary, man, you know. He's a scary, but he, he's, he's towering home been looking down at me. I thought, if you was in bed with my bird, I'd tuck you in, mate. <laughs> <laughs> he is a monster. <laughs> but I think he's the greatest of all time. I know people say Khabib and that, but when you kind of look at Khabib's record, he's not fought anybody at the same level of John Jones. Like He was world champion after. He was fighting the elite of elite. Obviously, Khabib's a great fighter, isn't he? He's like, he is the all-time greatest as well. Like, he's up there, man. Like, but... So going forward for all, you've won the bell, got the door, you're flying high, you're buzzing, you've got Christmas yeah. coming up. Like, is it trying to fix things with family members now and enjoy a bit of family time and try and unwind? Or do you ever think you could unwind? Yeah, definitely. Oh, it's unwind time, that's for sure. Yeah, mate. yeah, yeah. Like I'm looking forward to after this now, I'm nipping to the Christmas market. It's not been it, I go for years, mate. Yeah. Going there with my mates and having a few mulled wines and just chilling and go to bed and not have to be up at fucking daft o'clock to, to go and smash someone's head in or get my head smashed in. Mm -hmm. Like, just be able to chill and like, I'm having this big do tomorrow night, the Where? homecoming in Manchester. Are you? Yeah, mate. Like, mad. Everyone's coming. Yeah. Darren's coming down. Love all Dan. the scousers. Yeah. Trying to get Fury out for a pint and mm -hmm. trying to get all the boys out, Hatton. And like, yeah, mate, just, just, they're just dead happy to be home and like, dead proud that Manchester's got another world champion and mm -hmm. I was the first person from Manchester to ever fight in the UFC ever mm -hmm. and now I'm the first man Keenan MMA world champion I'm ticking boxes all the way along and I can't wait till tomorrow night mate and just be amongst it completely with all the manx and proper enjoy the moment yeah like I've met majority of fighters Hart and Crowler man they're all they're all fucking legends in their own right like it's a beautiful thing to see mate proud of you like I believe this is only the beginning mate to where you're going to go even go even further like 2023 is just another big year. I think you won another one of them. Mm. Just go for it, mate, innit? It's looking Fucking like it. Go for it, mate. I'm chatting shit, James. I'm definitely yeah, going to get down. No, you are, mate. I'm fucking <laughs> lying bastard. It's, it's only because I'm getting on the mold wide. Yeah. Right. Do you become a target now that you are number one? The people then want to go raise their game to then try and knock you off, off your fucking well, PFL hard always back me hard and give me loads of media and 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 so I was always the guy to beat in there, like that cocky little English guy. We're gonna smash him because I'm the only English guy in there. Um, they give away six belts on that night and it was to six different countries. That, mm -hmm. that show is just like, it's got people, brings in the best from all over the world. So there's a massive target, but I just say, fuck you all and bring it on. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> for any young fighters watching, brother, what advice would you have for them? Oh, mate, just get good coaches. Just believe in yourself and just go for it. Even if the door shuts in your head 30 times, the 31st will be worth it. Yeah, you're not, listen, you're living proof that don't fucking take no for an answer. Do not. For anybody struggling with mental health as well, that like, again, what advice would you have for them? I mean, I just believe in, in training for mental health. I really do. I just think there's nothing better than getting up, doing a 5K run or getting up, doing a bit of yoga, doing up, go for a walk. It just sends signals to the brain that nothing else does. Um, you know when you had a good spa and the feeling you get after it. Mm -hmm. Is there any feeling like a good training session? No, it's the best. There's nothing else. It's mm -hmm. invigorating. And I think... Mental health, I think, definitely get yourself off the couch and get training. I really do.
Brendan, listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story. Thoroughly enjoyed that. I'm buzzing for you, mate. You've got a great energy, good soul, and I look forward to see what you do for the future. Would you like to finish up on anything? Thanks for having me, finally. Yeah. Put <laughs> me a gold belt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Listen, enjoy your Christmas. You thoroughly deserve that, and I look forward to see what you do 2023, brother. Top man.